first ever American Cancer Society initiative. And we're calling this Healed Community Gathering. And I'd like to start this gathering and end it with a attitude of gratitude. So thank you, thank you, thank you to our presenting sponsor, 6ABC. Thanks, Bernie, and your entire Action News crew for wonderful. I'd like to thank our leadership partners who are making this HEALD program possible, helping us raise 1.7 million over the past two months. We've got a ways to go, but what a great start. And I thank each and every one of you for donating whatever you felt you could. I really, really appreciate it. And then coming on and sharing this hour of power with us. This is wonderful. It's going to be wonderful. And I'm telling you that if you don't get pinged a little, ah, then I'm not doing my job. I want you to say, wow, or yes, something that touches the deep recesses of your heart. And to that point, I like to start this community gathering with a moment of stillness. I love starting meetings with just a little stillness. And I'm going to describe how we're going to do this first. So before we do it, I'm just going to describe it. It's less than half a minute. And I'm going to ask you to take a deep breath from the bottoms of your feet, the soles of your feet, all the way up. And I'll be counting to five all the way as the breath comes all the way up to the top of the crown of your head and then flows like a wave all the way back down to the soles of your feet on the floor. And we will be resting at the midway point and at the end. So with me right now, close your eyes. Close your eyes and take a deep breath in from the soles of your feet. One, two, up across your hips. Three, four, your shoulders at the top of your head, five. Now hold your breath there. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Now, let it just flow down like the crashing of a wave. Five, four, your shoulders. Three, your elbows. Two, your hips. One, your knees. And back down to the floor. Hold it, hold it. Open your eyes. For those of you who never meditated, you just did. You just focused on your breath and your energy, your chi, as it flows through the body. And what happened during that less than half a minute was, and you don't realize this till afterward, you didn't have any stress, no worries, no frustrations, no guilt, no shame, no blame, no judgment, no criticisms. You were free from suffering. And so you can use that little meditative exercise whenever you want, wherever you are throughout the course of the day. It's just a simple way of being in the present moment. And that is our intention. Our intention here at the American Cancer Society is to help you, educate you, inspire you, inform you, entertain you, and encourage you to live the healthiest life in the present moment, in the present moment, to flow with life. Not think about living life, but to be life itself. And in sports, we call that the flow. And someone who was in the flow, so much so that he was the best at his trade. Let me just read a little bit about our guest, our first guest, Michael Jack Schmidt. I used to call him Jack when we were working out together because I'd say, you aren't Jack. And he would get them all fired up and he would just blow me out of the water, blow me out of the gym. But Michael Jack Smith played for the Philadelphia Phillies in the National, in the uh, Major League Baseball, in the National League, for 18 years. And of those 18 years, he was an all-star in a dozen of them. And I know this because I was experiencing him during his third one. Out of those 18 years and those 12 all-star accreditations, three times he was the National League MVP. That means top of the heap, best ball player on the planet in the National League. He hit 548 home runs, but it wasn't just his power at the bat. This guy played defense. He had, I think, how many Golden Gloves? He had uh, 10 times, <laughs> 10 Golden Glove awards in the National League at third base. That means he could catch a cold if it was going by. This guy was amazing. 
at the plate in the field. No wonder he is known as one of the great, greatest third basemen who ever played the game of baseball. Please, it's my honor and privilege to bring on Michael Jack Schmidt. Jack, come on on. Is Michael there? I can't hear him, Scotty. I think it's Mike, Mike, I'm going to get, you're going to need to turn on your microphone and your video from your side. I can't do it from here. So you can see we're live, everyone. How cool is this? <laughs> There's a little mic and a little camera, Michael, that have a red line going through them. There you go. I see. I'm unmuted. You're unmuted. Now you just have to hit the, there you go. And there he is. What an Enter entrance. <laughs> Thanks for that wonderful introduction, Patrick. You got me on the screen where you want me? Exactly. Okay, great. Yeah, Patrick, that's such a nice introduction. Um, you know, and all of the things you mentioned, you played a major, major role in that, uh, as you and I know you did. And uh, I got to draw off, draw off the Pat Croce energy for many, many years there uh, in the 1980s. And uh, if you can't draw energy from you, my brother, you can't get it from anybody. Well, Michael Jack, can you tell us if there was a secret, how did you do it? Uh, a secret. Uh, I think. I think the secret uh, is really unknown. Um, I think it's it's energy, it's uh, fate. I think uh, you can't uh, accomplish a career like like we were able to do for me um, without being somewhat injury free there were there were no major injuries so you know I, I i got through basically unscathed uh my injuries were earlier in life so while i played for the phillies i didn't have any major stoppages uh, in terms of injury i had <clears throat> tremendous faith in the lord um throughout the entire thing uh, i could always go to prayer um, i could always go to meditation um, Quiet times for me were very valuable. <clears throat> I loved the inner workings of the game, um, the mechanical elements of the game of baseball. They really intrigued me, and I was to the to a fault probably too wired into the mechanical side of the game, uh, the intricacies of the game of baseball. That's what I really loved, and still do, by the way. Uh, family, I had fantastic and still have after 47 years the wife uh, Donna who I drew energy from and who made most of what I what I did possible by being a uh, very loving wonderful wife and mother you know you to achieve greatness in anything you have to be somewhat selfish Patrick um, you know you 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 sometimes uh put your craft ahead of your family. And Donna allowed me to do that. Um, what else? Uh, great teammates, friendships, you know, to draw energy off of. Um, you know who a lot of those people are. Um, they sat and worked out and sweated with <laughs> him. You know, who, you know who most of them are, actually. They just and, couldn't keep, they just couldn't keep up with you. Yeah, and, and in fact, a lot of them came from other sports, you know, from the basketball and the hockey um, uh, teams. And um, some mornings, if people could come in from the outside, what was going on in that Broomall gym, they'd see some, they'd see some big names in there, wouldn't they, Pat? Oh my goodness, you're talking. So let's just review. And I don't go back to the past much, Michael Jack, but with you right now, the memories were just so vivid. So. We would work out at 7 a.m. And Michael Jack was never, right. ever late, ever. And in fact, <laughs> I, had, I had a key. <laughs> right? I was going to say, he had a key because he was adamant about choreographing the music. This was Casey Kasem <laughs> <laughs> and the music that we would work out to. I'm not saying the Sixers who came in 
dug his music. That's why he had a key to come in and put his tape on before they got in because there would be some rioting. Little cassette tapes, Patrick, and uh, you know, I uh, I I recorded my music and music I know I knew would gonna gonna be good for working out. You know, <laughs> you know, we did the thirty minute sessions, right? Uh, five you know five minutes on each machine, and you'd scream at us, and uh, uh, you weren't laughing when you screamed a lot of times. <laughs> all yelled one minute you know when there was one minute left in the five minutes and we went as hard as we could for five minutes and uh unbelievable training method and uh, you know those years with you i was in the best shape of my life in fact i think it started in uh what 1984 or five when uh my close friend alan flashner walked me into your corner you know your corner store there when it first started in Brunel. oh yeah i'll never forget walking in the door that day and uh, you you, you know, it's kind of evaluating me until we talked. And um, that's when we started working out together. And um, then, then you expanded and moved down the shopping center, right, to a bigger place. And so the rest of all that time and into the 90s, uh, we went hard at it. Let me say something to everyone that that 1300 square foot, that little sugar shack where we first started, Michael Jack, I... I was doing the flyers at the time, but I was a nobody with the flyers. I was this conditioning coach, physical therapist, nothing. When Michael Jack Schmidt started to change and transform his body and get his third MVP, now all of a sudden I'm recognized. And it was the beginning of the launch of my career. And this is the man right here, right here. And I thank you. You may be giving me a little too much credit, but I'll I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, before we go on, Mike, before we go on, you said something in your secret that you took advantage of the quiet times in baseball. What did you mean by that? Um, well, there's a lot of quiet times. <clears throat> there's uh there's at night at home when you come when you get home after a game and uh, you know, you, you go to the ballpark at three in the afternoon and you don't generally get home at night till 11 30, 12 o'clock. We used to stay around the clubhouse a lot and uh, uh, you know, talk about the game and let the crowd uh, get out of the area. And so, you know, we drive home, we get home till around midnight. So you're pretty wired at that time from playing the game and it's hard to go to sleep right away. So that's a, that's a, nice quiet time for you to kind of evaluate um the game and how it went some some nights were obviously a little harder than others based upon your performance or whether the team won or lost so you know that's quiet time uh, there's quite a lot of quiet time when you're on the road you know when you're um living in a, in your hotel room when you're on the road and you you come back and there's a lot of time again to to sit and think and um and, and, you know, I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm always in my quiet time thinking about my sport. I mean, I'm thinking about my faith. I'm thinking about my family. And, and you know, both of those things probably are higher on a priority list uh, for me. In fact, I know they were than, than the actual sport and the performance of the sport. You know, people see the sport that, and me in the sport and that relationship, but they don't, you know, that people don't see you you thinking about your faith and your family and things like that you do that <clears throat> you do that during your quiet time and during my quiet time <clears throat> i i would say pat i was always in the in, in the uh what i want to say in the sense of wanting to better myself mm -hmm. Whether it be becoming a better father, a better Christian, or a better baseball player, I'm, I'm always, I was kind of always in the mood uh, of trying to find a way to be better. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know, one person being too hard on himself, a lot of people say, say it was. I mean, a lot of times you might not see, you know, you might not see me and seem like I'm really having a lot of fun because... I, you know, I'm not someone that walks around with a grin on his face all the time. And, and uh, you know, my brain's always kind of working too hard on things. But uh, I think in the end, my quiet time and, and what went on in that quiet time was very, very important in my accomplishments as a father, as a Christian, as a ball player. 
So take those qualities that you just described. How did they transfer into your experience with melanoma? Oh, there you go, Pat. Uh, uh, some transition you just made there. You <laughs> well, I, you know, it's important because everyone placed stress on you to be the greatest ball player. But now you're placing internal stress on yourself because now you have this diagnosis of cancer. Yes, sir. And, and I know you know a lot about that. And, um, you know, there, it, it's life changing for sure. We, um, we go through life uh, as people out in the public eye for one reason or another. And we, we, we start to feel invincible, if not, mm. you know, long uh, before that. I mean, I think uh, uh, most, of my, most of my sporting life and uh, uh, the life back when we knew each other, you, you tend to get the feeling of, in, uh, of being invincible, whether it's uh, driving a car home at night and speeding down the road, knowing that you'll never, they'll never give you a ticket because you're... <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you, you tend to feel invincible people carry your luggage uh when you're on the road uh, you snap your fingers and you get whatever you want around the ballpark uh, um, you, you make a, a ton of money playing a game you love so you're you know you're 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 wealthy uh you're able to achieve, you're you're able to to buy things uh you know whenever you want them uh it it gives you a, a real sense of being invincible and that September, early the first week in September in 2013, that all ended for me. Um, the feeling of, in, of being invincible, and uh, it, it ended with the uh, discovery of, of a mole on my back that was uh, uh, assessed as uh, stage three melanoma. Now there is a stage four melanoma and a two and a one, of course, but. Uh, stage three is a bad, uh, a bad case of melanoma. And, you know, of course, then the, uh, the you know, the, the process started after that with the doctors and the consultations and what do we do next and the surgeries and, and the chemotherapies and the drugs and uh, um, all the things, fortunately, that were available to me at that time that weren't available, say, 10 years earlier. Um, you know, the immunotherapy drugs are uh, amazing things now. They're saving lives uh, um, like crazy. And I was one of the fortunate ones whose life was saved because um, my body matched up with a drug called uh, Yervoy. And uh, we, we tried several things before Yervoy was a match for me. And um, it basically saved my life. The melanoma got in my brain. It got uh, uh, in my lungs. Uh, I had to have all my lymph nodes removed. Um, so, you know, throughout that time, and in fact, I'm still on, you know, still on um, uh, a process of, of continuing to, to keep it at bay, if you will. And uh, it's still at the center of my life. Um, but I'm able to say, you know, thanks to the good Lord that, uh, a drug matched up with me and that I'm totally stable right now. And there's no more, no, not, there's nothing more in my lungs and what was in my brain is almost gone. And, you know, thank God for, for that. And I know you could probably relate to what I'm talking about yourself. Um, but again, uh, it, it changed my life. Uh, it, um, and it happened because of my faith. It happened because of my wife. Uh, it happened because of the medical team that I had working for me. Um, the lucky man, Patrick, you know, um, and I thank God every day for it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's made me a better person. It's uh, in what way? Well, it's made me in, enjoy every day <laughs> more than I used to. <laughs> yes. Because for me, for me, each day has been a bonus, right? Uh, um, in, uh, in its simplest form, that's true. You know, it's yeah, actually each day is a, is a bonus day for me. Um, it's, it's made me feel a, a st maybe able to love stronger, um, to, to be uh, a more appreciative of the love in my life and, and the ability to love. I don't think I ever, on the scale of knowing how to love and how to feel love, I mean, I was kind of down. 
I was kind of down here and now I'm way up here. You know, mm, I, wow. you know what I'm saying? I feel uh, the ability to uh, experience love with my wife and my family and other people for sure, my friends. Um, a lot more, there's a lot more I love yous going around now than, the, you know, than there was in my early days. So we and, get to finally feel and see the true you, which is beautiful. I got to ask you, if at any time during your cancer diagnosis, the treatment plan, or even now, the sort of fear dangled over your head, how did yeah. you deal with it? I can remember um, this this may sound a little crude, but I can remember sitting on the toilet was always torture <laughs> for, for one, one way or the other. Uh, well, maybe torture is too, diff too, too strong of a word. That's, you know, that goes back to the old quiet time thing. Mm -hmm. Something we, every person in the world has in common, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is quiet time. And, you know, your mind kind of races and it, it runs away to maybe this is the end. What should I do? Should I get should I get my uh, uh, should, should I get my life in order? Should I start thinking about uh, you know uh, my estate planning and you know should, you know all of those kind of things because maybe this is in fact the end. I'd sit at uh, street lights at red lights a lot of times and my mind would just kind of go off into well you know maybe the, you know it's like maybe this is the real end. And, and the reality of my life coming to an end at what basically was an, too soon um, for me um, became a reality. You know, it, it, it became a reality. And man, that's a, that'll slap you right in the face and change the way about everything in this world and, and your family and friends and, you, you know, just, and every one of us at some point in time will go through you know, go through with that. And, uh, you know, unless it's an unfortunate emergency or, or accident or something, but if you're ever, you know, people are ever presented with uh, the reality of, of dying, uh, it, it, it's really, I want to say it's an awful experience. It's a, it's a dread. There's a lot of dread involved with it. And the experience of having that dread for me with, you know, my faith in God and everything allowing me to come out of the out the other end and be able to say to you right now, um, cancer is stable and, and I'm fine right now. In fact, I'm a lot better right now having gone through it. Now you know, Patrick, you never I never I never talk about beating cancer. I never say I beat it, you know, I beat it or anything like that, because I know it can come back and get you you know, tomorrow, tonight, it can come back. It can come back. And uh, so I never like to brag about having beaten cancer, but um, just the elements of, uh, of what I've told you right now is, is how it all unfolded for me. Michael Jack, and I thank you for your humble, courageous sharing right there. I would like to ask you, what would you like to leave behind with our community. This is a community gathering. It's the American Cancer Society's goal through HEALD to create a supportive community where the information you're imparting on us can be shared. You may not have had someone like we have them using you to depend on and feel, okay, he did it, I can do it. What would you like to leave? What's your leave behind for this community? Well, Pat, you, you hit the nail on the head right there. If, if he did it, if Michael Jack could go through this and come out whole on the other end, and I can do it. Now, I told you the elements um, of my experience, and it was faith in God. I spoke to God so many times, uh, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you, and still do, you know, and still do. That's, I think that's part of your energy that you're talking about. Uh, uh, maybe you, you feel it in a different form, but for me, that's, that's the energy um, that kept me going. Donna being there right by my side through the whole thing, telling me that it's going to be okay. We are going to get through this. Mm. We are going to get through this. And then I was fortunate to 
have access to a lot of real top-notch medical uh, people at Mass General in Boston, down here, what I consider the most, the best oncology people down here in, uh, in Florida where we live. They teamed up for, on me, you know, from both places, Florida and, and, and Boston. You needed, a du- you needed a double team. Yeah, yeah. And I had one. I'm uh, very close to those people. And, you know, I know that, you know, I know that your average person that may be going through what I went through may not have that kind of access, you know, but you, you can find it. You, I mean, you need to trust your medical people. You need to have a good relationship with them. Uh, you need to think positive. You need to, you know, you, you need to, um, um, uh, draw energy uh, from your friends. You need you need to allow people in. You know what mm. I mean. You need to allow the people in your life that that feel that you know people kind of feel like oh man I don't want to bother him. He's going through really tough times right now. They really want to help you. They really you know people want to bring you food at night. You know what I mean. They want they want to be in your life and. You got to let them in, you know, you got to let them in because you can draw positive energy from them, you know, so kind of all of that uh, happened in my life right now. And I can't tell you, you know, I got to tell you, a lot of it's still going on Mm. and it's making me, you know, making me better. I mean, I, I I don't know that I could have spoken like this to you um, or, or say, you know, I mean, we're accessing a lot of people with your with your show right now, but I don't know if I could accomplish speaking the way I'm speaking about my life right now. Um, if you go back, you know, to before this happened, you know, if you go back to before 2013, I mean, it opened up a lot for me. You see that that vulnerability that you're demonstrating right now is an invincibility because it's just. I, yeah, right. It's your true you coming through. And Michael, you were going to have to let you go because we have our exercise physiologist, but please feel free to stay. And you said two things I want to comment on. Energy, energy is part of health and energy through active living every day. That's HEAL. And the energy you spoke of, and there's a little, this is my energy segment for this gathering, is that I suggest that everyone have a water bottle. Have a water bottle so that you hydrate. It seems simple, but it's so good because water is necessary for your metabolism, for your fluid, for the fluids necessary in your blood pressure, for eliminating waste, for lubrication of joints. So I have a water bottle. I'm bad. I do drink a glass of water with each meal, a big 16 ounce glass, but I have to force this. Diana is always on me. And on my water bottle, Jack, it says, well, I'm going to tell you what it says on a poem. I love this Haviz. It's got a Buddha there, but I, I don't want to give it away. I'm going to read. I'm going to read a poem by Haviz. He's a 14th century Sufi mystic, and you talked about God. And it's called "The Seed Cracked Open." It used to be that when I would wake in the morning, I could with confidence say, "What am I going to do?" That was before the seed cracked open. Now Haviz is certain. There are two of us housed in this body, doing the shopping together in the market, tickling each other while fixing the evening's food. Now, when I awake, and this sounds like you, Michael Jack, all the internal instruments play with the same music. God, what love mischief can we do for the world today? And that's what my water bottle says. God, what love mischief can we do for the world today? That's nice. I have one myself. And I actually am not a fan of water. <laughs> <laughs> what do you drink? Well, no water. And uh, I'm just saying I make myself drink it because every time I go to get uh, like, you know, my skin check or something like that, the guy will say, are you drinking water? Are you drinking your water? And I'm never drinking enough water. I so agree. I, I carry one of those things now. And um I do drink a lot of water right now, but uh, I wish it tasted better. I guess I could put some of that little powder in it or something you know, to, to flavor the water. But uh, you are 100% right about the water. That's all part of the healing process, you know. 
I'm, uh, I, I second your opinion. I, I force water. I drink it with each meal, but I don't drink anything else. I don't drink soda. I don't drink juices. And so I, I force water and I, you know, I, I shift it to wine at happy hour, but nevertheless, I still have the water during meals. <laughs> hey, give me knuckles on that wine at happy yeah. hour. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Jack, you can Patrick, see everyone why I love this man. I'll be here and I'm here for you anytime. I'm going to listen to your, I want to listen to UC Jr. there after, after your uh, person. So, uh, so good to see you. So good to uh, be with you. Uh, I love you. No question about it. I think you ought to cut about an inch off that beard though, brother. I love you, my brother. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Take care. Now, healed. Health and energy through active living every day. This is the woman who created the program in 2019. Let me introduce you to Dr. Erica Reese Panuya. And she received her public health degree from Emory, a master's in public health, a PhD in exercise physiology, so we can call her doctor, but she allows us to call her Erica, from the University of Georgia. And she did her postdoctorate fellowship at the American, at the American Cancer Society in Atlanta, where she's from. Uh, she's the principal scientist of HEALD. She's from Chicago. She was a runner in college, but now she switched, still very active, very fit. Who wouldn't want to be have an exercise physiologist who believes in fitness? She's into boxing. So Erica, first, before we talk about HEALD, I want to know a little bit about boxing. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, first, thanks for having me or her today. It's so exciting to be here. Yes, boxing is my big thing now. So when I finished college, I ran, I ran track through college. Um, I had some foot injuries and I was just sort of looking for a new activity that I could do that wasn't as high impact on my feet, but still shared a lot of the same principles of running, running fast. I was a sprinter. So I wanted something that had power, um, that required speed and technique. And for the first time at like 23 years old, I just tried boxing and I loved it. And so I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> well, your face doesn't look any wreckage from it. No, no, I can get out of the way pretty quickly <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> so give us, give us some insights on how you started the HEALD Research Project, the pilot study from two years ago, or even how it, even the genesis prior to that. Where'd the idea come from? Yeah, so part of the idea came from, of course, that we have 16.9 million cancer survivors in the US today. This is a number that's expected to grow, and it's, of course, because of improved cancer survivorship through early detection, better treatments. But what we know is that physical activity is safe for most cancer survivors, and it's beyond being safe, beneficial for our mental health, our physical health, but despite all of that, we know that about 70% of cancer survivors are not active enough. And so for me, you know, being with this being my area of expertise, this being my career and this being my passion, I really wanted to develop something to help cancer survivors to be more active and to really enjoy the benefits of physical activity. So, so yes, yeah, so we started the HEALD pilot in 2019 and we used a number of behavior change techniques to help deliver what is completely a web-based intervention to a small group of cancer survivors. So we had about 85 survivors in our pilot study. Um, but the pilot study was promising. Um, cancer survivors, they liked it. They learned a lot from it about being active and being active every day. Um, and so we, of course, wanted to expand it. We felt that that was um, enough support to expand our ideas, to have it full scale, make it bigger and better and offer it to more survivors. So that's where we are now. We're in the planning stages, of course, thanks to all of the great donations. Um, we're gonna be able to give the website a big glow up. It's gonna be much nicer. It's gonna be more professional and enticing and motivating. Um, and we're gonna have 400 cancer survivors in our, in our larger study this time. And are they specific to any diagnosis? 
So yeah, so the cancer survivors in our study are all survivors of cancers that are associated with physical inactivity. So there are seven different cancer types that we have some really good evidence for being associated with physical inactivity. So these are bladder, breast, colon, endometrial, esophageal, kidney, and gastric. So it's, it's likely that, that physical inactivity is associated with some other types of cancer, but we need a bit more research on that. So for now, we're restricting to just those that we have very good evidence for being associated with physical inactivity. And when you say a cancer survivor, are, is that, what does that exactly mean? Well, there are different definitions of it. Uh, for our particular study, we are looking at people with a history of one of these seven cancers. Um, and we're actually looking for people who are past their active treatment phase. So people who are no longer uh, undergoing chemotherapy, radiation therapy, um, they, they're beyond that point and they just have a history of cancer in their life. And so this study is going to check out what variables you talked about behavior data can you give us some yeah. examples that in like in layman's terms totally yeah so we are going to be using a research grade device that people will wear on their hip that will be able to show us how active people are being and when i say how active people are being i mean every type of activity right so of course we want to look at that exercise that that focus time where we are getting our sweat on, our heart is racing. But we're also looking at things like light physical activity. So these would be things like maybe gardening or cleaning the house, things where you're, you're moving around and you're doing a little bit of activity, but you're not like sweating. It's not you know heavy exercise or what we would call moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, this is important because especially for cancer survivors, it's really important to avoid what we would call sedentary time. And this is really just time when you're sitting, you're laying down, you're chilling, you're not expending much energy. Um, and, and that's really important to avoid. So we'll be, we'll be looking at all those different types of activity. Um, and then the other outcomes that we're interested in looking at are um, related to cognitive function. So we have some really good evidence that um, there is a lot of benefits of exercise specifically for cancer survivors in things like reducing fatigue, having more energy, um, improving physical function, and also reducing feelings of depression and anxiety. But we need a bit more evidence um, as far as what the relationship between exercise and cognitive function might be for cancer survivors. So that's the other big outcome that we're looking at. Well, how do you do that? So we have several computer-based tests that we'll be giving people. Um, so there are different aspects of cognitive function that you can test. And so with each different uh, computer-based test, we'll be testing a different part of cognitive function. How many parts are there? There are several. It depends on what sort of model you look at, but we are going to have at least three different tests. So we'll have one survey that assesses sort of general cognitive function as far as like short-term memory. And then we'll mm. probably have two different computer-based tests too. Now, Erica, this might seem tough, but how do you plan to use your data to help cancer survivors in yeah. the future? So, one of our biggest goals, uh, once we are sure that our intervention website is effective in actually helping people to be more active and live an active lifestyle, is to take this evidence-based product and push it out to the public so that as many people can be motivated by it and so as many cancer survivors can become more active as possible. So, you know, first, we obviously do need to have this testing period where we're making sure it's evidence-based, we're studying it extensively, and that's what we're doing now. But beyond that, we do really want to like push it out to as many cancer survivors as possible. And I think one of the benefits of having it online is, of course, we're not restricted by geography, we're not restricted by access. Um, you know, we can, in theory, reach anybody across the country. Will it be free? The, the goal is for it to be free. So the ultimate goal is for it to be offered like through ACS. And of course we are a trusted source for cancer survivors and information. Um, and so that, that would be the ultimate goal to have it available somewhere, maybe on our website, somewhere through ACS for all cancer survivors for free. So I read some of your reports and you have quoted a saying that 70%, 70, 70 percent of cancer survivors don't move their butt. 
I'm, I use those terms, <laughs> are inactive. Is that possible? It's possible and it is true. So it is true that around 70% of survivors are not getting enough physical activity. So what this means is they're not meeting our physical activity guidelines. So our minimum physical activity guidelines for cancer survivors um, are three 30 minute sessions of what we would call moderate intensity physical activity per week. So this could be something like um, brisk walking, swimming, doubles tennis, um, any sort of activity where you know, you're out of breath, but you could still carry on a conversation. Um, in addition to that aerobic activity, we would also be hoping for two days at least of strength training. So weightlifting. Oh. So again, that's the minimum amount we would be hoping for. Um, of course, if you are you know, undergoing treatment and you're really not feeling well, doing as much as you can, avoiding inactivity uh, is, is key. Even a little bit is better than nothing. But yes, it's, it's true that uh, about 70% is not getting at least that amount. Wow. So Erica, as the principal scientist down in Atlanta at headquarters for HEALD, what would make you celebrate after this next 400 patients, 400 survivors were put through your research protocols? What would make you stand up and scream, yes? <laughs> I love that question. Um, I think, I mean, just seeing people become more active and enjoying it. I think a lot of people vision exercise or physical activity as, you know, being in a gym, lifting weights, running on a treadmill, which some of us enjoy, but some of us don't. And I think, you know, helping people to realize that there is a whole world of different types of physical activity out there. And there's probably at least one type that you enjoy to do and therefore will do, you know, every day, at least a few times a week. So helping people to find their own exercise journey and stick with it so that they can enjoy the benefits is like everything to me. <laughs> So, and I want you to stick around for our warrior segment with Hugh yeah. Smita Jr. But if you were to leave behind three tools that everyone, those touched by cancer and those who are touched by those who are touched by cancer, what would you recommend? Well, I would say, you know, the one thing that I, I always say is the best exercise for you because people will say, what's the best? What's the best exercise I can do? So the first thing I would definitely say is the best exercise for you is the one that you will do. Mm. I can tell you some fancy regimen of, of what I think is the best, but <laughs> yes, boxing. But if you don't like it and you don't do it, it doesn't matter. So first thing I would certainly say is the best one for you is the one you will do, the one you will like to do. The other thing I would say is, you know, more is better than some. And the third thing I would say is some is better than none. Oh, that's good. So, so if, if you, you know, heard those physical activity guidelines for cancer survivors and you thought, boy, that's a lot more than I'm already doing. I would say start somewhere. Some is better than none. But if you heard that amount of physical activity, and you thought I'm doing way more than that already. Keep doing it. More is better than some. <laughs> oh, I've never heard that. And I've been in the fitness world my entire life. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Now, I'm hoping that our next guest, you stay on, please, yeah. because I want you to help me with our next guest, Yus Mita Jr. Come on on, Yus. Yus is 43 years old. 11 years ago, Yus was diagnosed with brain cancer and given three to five years to live. Who's 22 years old. He's here with us today. He's our warrior story. And Yus, welcome. Welcome to our Healed Community Gathering, my brother. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. I was 32. I wish I was 22. Oh, 32. 32. Yeah. I'm sorry. And sorry. now 43. Yeah. So tell me, when you were diagnosed, what were the symptoms that brought about the diagnosis? You know, it's interesting. I had arthritis that was rotating around my body and was going to, I was working six days, uh, long hours, no kids and wife at this, you know, in the beginning of that and um, had to stop running. Um, and what happened was I, I visited different doctors and no one could find out. I actually went to the Mayo Clinic and did a review and they started from the neck down. Oh, so tons of tests. 
but I didn't have any headaches and I didn't have any um, vision issues. And so they never tested my brain. And what happened was uh, they were about to tear down the spectrum. It was the last 10 concerts. And um, I, went, I woke up after, after a Bruce Springsteen concert and, and collapsed from a seizure. So what happened was they sent me to a hospital then moved me to a second hospital, thought that maybe I had had a, um, uh, a stroke. And I woke up you know, in the hospital with my father and my uh, wife in front of me saying, hey, uh, you have a brain tumor and we gotta get it out ASAP. That was down at Jefferson in Philadelphia. And what happened from there was um, we kind of rushed that first surgery. And the, the surgeon did not, he thought that it was going to be, um, that, that the tumor would not be malignant. So had the first surgery, uh, went to visit the doctor. He wasn't there. And uh, the, their oncologist said, hey, we got to start your chemo and radiation. And in my brain, I immediately just thought, you know what? They must be looking at the wrong, the wrong person. I thought maybe they were looking at a, uh, a John O'Leary, you know, an Irishman, because a name like Eustace Mita, you know, I don't look like a Eustace Mita. So when, when he said oncology and uh, I mean, when he said chemo, I said, no, my name is Eustace Mita. And they said, yeah, you haven't spoke to the, to the surgeon. I said, no. And they said, we got to get you started. You have cancer. And that, you know, that shocked all of us. That was very shocking. So, so I went to a different uh, doctor and he said, hey, you need to get the rest of that tumor out. They only cut out a certain amount because uh, it's dangerous and you're cutting into your brain. And um, so I had to have a second awake, a second surgery called an awake craniotomy. They sat me down and they started going through cards. And I would say, yeah, that's a bear, that's a dog, that's a house. And they kept cutting. And as I went around through, he said, that's a, that starts with a B. And he said, yeah, that's a bear. I came back around again and they said, what is this? I said, I know what it is, but I can't say the word. It, it was a, you know, I couldn't say the noun. And that's when they said, okay, it's as far as we can go. And they, and they shut down the, uh, sir. Are you there, Yus? I think we just, he got frozen, Scotty. Yeah, uh, it looks like it hopefully will come back, but uh, I can't control it from here. That's on his side. Okay, well, while we're waiting for you to come back, Lauren, I presume we've had some questions come across the yeah. screen. Thanks so much, Pat. And we'll, we look forward to you coming back. The questions in the chat have been amazing. Um, people's participation has been great. We've really loved the honesty and wonderful sharing. So, um, Mike, Any questions cool. for Michael Jack or yes. for Erica? Yeah, we do. We have a question for Mike. If um, Mike's still on, Andy said, um, first of all, this is my dream. As a kid who grew up in Philly during the 80s and 90s, my God, two legends. Um, he'd love to ask Mike, what do you say to someone right now who is in the middle of their cancer journey, worrying about COVID, maybe feeling a little anxious or worried that could help pick them up and give them hope? Some words of encour encouragement to help them through these tough days. Let's see if Mike can get his mic turned off again. <laughs> Here he is. Hey, Mike. Hi. Um, could you repeat and your that? And your camera, too, Michael. There we go. There we go. Hi. Um, sure, I'd love to repeat it. So um, Andy asked if you have any words of encouragement for those who may be in the middle of their cancer journey worrying about COVID um, that could maybe help pick them up and give them hope. I don't think anything changes. Uh, basically the same as what I thought. I mean, prayer is a big part of it. And that means faith and, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, um, you know, your, whatever your doctor say, your, your, your medical team says, uh, people around you, friendships, let them in, um, follow the rules, the, uh, Quarantine rules and such, the mask wearing, social distancing, follow all those rules and stay positive. I, I you know, I don't know what else to say, actually. It's, it's basically the same formula for all this stuff, right? 
Yeah, it is. Thank and Michael, you. can I add something? And Lauren, yeah. this is this is the prayer that I was going to add at the very end, but I'd like to add it now because I think it's perfect for the question and mm -hmm. it coincides with Jack's answer. I would like everyone to say it's not a petitionary prayer. It's not asking for anything. I told you I would start and end this hour of power with an attitude of gratitude. So I'm going to just say it and you can repeat it after me. Thank you for the grace to help me welcome what is happening right now. Thank you for the grace in helping me welcome what is happening right now. If we can bring everyone to the present moment and be appreciative and welcome what is because only God is, then it allows the stress and strain of everything else, the past and the future, to just float away, at least for now. So that would be my suggestion. And I preempted my ending with that because it's just perfect for the question and for Michael's answer. Would you agree, Michael? Yeah, I was uh, strongly tied into God's will in my prayer. You know, let <clears throat> when I'm talking to God, I, you know, I, I talk to him, you know, let your will be done with me and I will accept it. You, you want to pull the whole thing back to the guys, you there? <laughs> we're there. We're here. We're back. I we're apologize. Back. And Michael, Michael just said and accept it. That's that welcoming what is. So if I can leave and with anything would be the welcoming what is. Young Use, you're back on? Yes, I'm back on. I switched offices. I apologize. You just knocked Michael Jack Schmidt out of the batting box. I want you to know <laughs> that no one's ever done that. That's well, fine. I don't know where it was in my story, but you know, it is about pivoting, right? We're pivoting these days with COVID. And, uh, and when you get cancer, like Mr. Schmidt said, that's what you have to do. You, you get humble and you got to pivot. And, and what happened, you know, I don't know where it was in my story, but, but um, I, my, I had the second surgery. I started on, I started doing uh uh, chemo and we were blessed with a my wife was six weeks pregnant when I had when I had my first uh my first you know surgery so our our second son was born and you know he came out with down syndrome so and we did not know that he had no heart issues as we went through and we were getting the the screens so so while I'm in the middle of doing, uh, I'm already finished my, my, um, or I'm in the middle of my chemo. That was another thing that, that we had to pivot. So uh, it was a tough part of my life. And, and what we're looking for, what I'm looking forward to now is not only Dr. Uh, Erica's physical healing, but the, the body, spirit, mind healing from, from you, Pat, and from, from Healed and, and, uh, the Cancer Society. Okay, Youth, then thank you. Thank you for sharing those experiences. What are you doing now to be active? So that's a great question. Right now, I'm not. Right now, I'm ready to be a guinea pig for, for you guys and for the team. I do a little bit of walking or I chase. I, I now have four boys. I chase them around. But aside from that, I'm not doing enough. All I do is drink my water. Uh, and, and I'm eating too much. So I'm looking forward to joining the team now. So if you were to say you were overweight, by how much would that be to your, your suggested weight? Yeah, so if, I would like to lose 50 pounds to get me you know, under 200. I wrestled in college at 167 and probably weighed around 180 at the time. And you weigh what now, would you guess? 245. Okay, now that's the first point. We don't want guessing. I want you standing on the scale today. I know your mother, Susie, was a nurse. I want her to- 246.8, Pat, 246.8. I want that, okay, so I want that recorded. Do you journal? I don't. Okay, I would ask you to start journaling. I wish everyone would journal. I'm a journaling junkie. Every day I journal something. You will all be in my journal tomorrow morning, early in the morning. I would ask that you journal and put down all of these vital statistics, your weight, your blood pressure, your resting heart rate taken for a full minute, not 10 seconds multiplied by six. It can be six beats off. Your 
waistline, taken at your belly button because that bugger doesn't move. I don't want it up and low and say, no, I lost three inches. No, at the same spot. And then put some, your belt, you know, the loops of your belt, just keep track of it. But I would want you to take those measurements as just some objective data that you can monitor along the way, in addition to subjective data, data perceived exertion. And maybe Erica would like to share something right now on what you could evaluate on a weekly basis. Erica? Sure, yeah. I mean, you know, certainly following at minimum those physical activity guidelines that I mentioned before. Um, but then also, you know, even if you follow the physical activity guidelines, that's you're spending a small proportion of your day being, being active at a, a what we would call a moderate to vigorous level. But that still leaves a whole lot of your day left. So taking that time um, to make sure that you're not sitting too much, that you're still doing how we say active living, you know, moving about, you know, choosing activities that are a little bit more active versus activities like watching TV. Um, but of course, a, a big thing for you also would be would be diet, which you will get to hear a bit more about from some other experts um, in the coming weeks. Um, so yeah, really just just noting what you're doing throughout the day and, and avoiding too much too much sitting is important. Erica, you asked a great question earlier. You you are asked a great question. What's the best exercise? And you said the one you like, the one you will do. Use, <laughs> use, did you hear that? The one that you will do. And when we're talking about health and energy through active living every day, that means no day off. When you go to church <laughs> on Sundays, you still have to go walking or whatever you will do. But don't, here's what I do recommend. Start low and progress slow. That's really important. Don't go out and try to walk four miles if you haven't been walking. You'll get shin splints and pulled muscles and then you're done. Then you're on the bench. And always make sure for everyone at the gathering today, make sure you check with your doctor first. Make sure that your doctor, your oncologist says it's okay to exercise and at the levels that you want to exercise. That's really, really important. Journal, starting statistics, doctor's okay. List of activities you want to do, according to Erica. Water, water, force water, anything else. And we're going to follow. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to follow Young Use. He's being vulnerable and courageous with us. He's been courageous all his life, having to deal with brain cancer. And now he's going to be with us. And every month or six weeks, he's going to check in with us to make sure we know how well Young Use is doing. Because if he can do it, we can all do it. Agreed. Use, are you agreeable to all that? I am. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the new challenge. Do you have an exercise of choice or exercises? Yes. I mean, I like jogging, but I, I, I got the Peloton, so, and I got a gym membership. Beautiful. So how often will you go to the gym? I think we're going to start with three days a week. Okay. And the other four days, how will you do active living? You mean besides drinking water? No, we'll, yes. I'll, do, I'll do some walking, jogging, and then if, when my wife jumps off, I'll do the Peloton. And I know that where you work, where the establishments that you work at and you visit, I want you parking your car so far from the front door that you sweat by the time you get there. Fair enough. I'll see if I can bike there. And don't even believe in an elevator. There's no such thing as elevators. Roger that. Thank you. Any, do you have any questions for Erica? I do not. No, just a thank you to Dr. Erica and, and to the ACS, you know, heal team. Let's heal, heal, heal me, you know, physically, and then, uh, and then we'll work on mentally. And mentally, we don't have to wait for mentally. We don't have to wait. Remember, it's we encourage you for a healthier life in the present moment. Be as present and mindful of whatever activities you're doing, whatever they are, without judgment. Place your attention lovingly on whatever you're doing. That's called mindfulness. And that will help alleviate a lot of stress, strain, worry, which will allow you to focus more of a high vibrational frequency into what you're doing with a smile. And that will vibrate and resonate out with everyone around you. And I know you're a leader in business and in your family. Everyone depends on you for that.
Thanks, Kabish. So Thank you, Kabish. Thank you, guys. Lauren. Thanks so much for being with us, everyone. We're so grateful. And um, Pat, I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, we're done. So is that, well, I guess that's the close. I get this beautiful smile to tell me we've ended again. Thank you for the grace in helping me to welcome what is happening. As Michael said, thy will be done. Until next week, same time, same place, the here and now. Peace. <laughs>